As anyone who has been to Europe recently knows, our dollar is a shadow of its former self. Just a few years ago, a nice dinner in a reasonable Paris cafe would have cost us about $40 a person. Today, it can cost almost twice that. Ouch. If our economy is strong and we're the world's greatest superpower, why does the rest of the world place so little value on our currency? I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is our topic today on USA Inc. Joining us today is Robert Hormatz, Vice Chairman of Goldman Sachs International and a keen observer of international financial issues for the last few decades. Bob, thanks for being with us today. Nice to be with you. Tell us about the dollar. I mean, if you're in this country, you don't notice much, but if you go overseas, it's a bit of a shock. It certainly is. Well, the dollar has had a number of gyrations. Uh, it has gone from weak to strong, strong to weak. And basically now it's in a period where it's uh, been strengthening rather considerably against the euro, although it had a weak period six or eight months ago. And uh, for the moment, when you go around the world, um, if the dollar is strong, it enables you to buy things in France or in Switzerland for a lot less. Whereas if the dollar is weak, then goods that you buy in the rest of the world tend to cost more. But over the last few years, I think the perception is that the dollar has uh, basically been weakening against both the euro and Asian currencies. And I'm trying to understand how that could be the case given our role as a superpower and a strong economy. You're right. Over the last several years, if you took a track of the dollar and sort of discounted all the gyrations, the dollar has been weaker. And the dollar has been weaker in large measure because we have a very big trade deficit with the rest of the world in a very big current account deficit, which is largely the result of the trade deficit. And what that means is that the market tends to expect the dollar to be weaker to help to increase the competitiveness of American goods relative to goods around the world, which will, over a period of time, if so the theory goes, lead to an improvement in the U.S. trade balance. And that's the whole idea of the currency markets they tend, in a way, to anticipate or to track expectations about the adjustments required in order to reduce big trade imbalances. I'm going to try to break that down for people that are um, not as familiar with the currency markets or, as you are. Uh, if, you're, if you're running a trade deficit, as this country is, why would that mean the dollar would be weaker? Well, What's if you're running happening? a trade deficit, you tend to depend very heavily on foreign capital to finance that trade deficit. And what's happened is that the rest of the world is really financing the fact that the United States imports a lot more than it exports. Now, where do we get the money to pay for that? Foreigners provide capital to the U.S. economy, and that enables us to finance this very large trade imbalance. So we have an appetite for goods that are um made overseas and we're paying for that, we're basically getting into debt with foreign investors. We're, yes? We're, yes. We're incurring a lot of debt as a result of the fact that foreigners are exporting more to us than they're importing from us. And for the moment, they're very happy in financing that because the foreigners, to the extent they finance that, create jobs at home as a result of the goods they produce and the goods they sell us. And not only are they financing it, they're financing it at very low interest rates because the rate of savings in Asia, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea, they have a very high rate of savings. So they're shipping us cheap money, which tends to keep interest rates down here. And they're also shipping us relatively inexpensive goods, which tends to keep the price of products down here. When you go to Walmart or Kmart or other places, you're getting relatively cheap apparel, shoes, televisions, other things, because they're coming in from various parts of the world. So we're getting inexpensive goods and inexpensive capital. And for the moment, that's the environment we're operating in. 
Sounds like a great picture. Why should anyone have any problems with that? It is a great picture for the moment for consumers, particularly if you want to finance a home, you're getting cheaper mortgages as a result of that. But there's a problem, and the problem is that some people in various parts of the manufacturing sector, and to a degree the services sector now, find that there's a lot of competition from abroad, and that tends to mean either lower wages here or in some cases that American companies will ship their production to China or India or some other part of the world to take advantage of, of low-cost labor. And not only low-cost labor, but highly skilled low-cost low labor in, in many of these countries. The other part of the problem is that you can't borrow forever. You can borrow for a long time, but as we borrow, we have to pay interest on that money, and that interest over a period of time accumulates. And it's also the case that at some point the foreign lenders might not be so eager to lend us money. Or if they lend us money, they may want a higher interest rate for lending us this money. And therefore, while this is a very pleasant arrangement in some respects now, because it does keep interest rates low and keeps prices low for American consumers, it is not permanently sustainable because over a period of time, we're incurring more debt. We have to pay interest on that debt. And at some point, we may find that foreigners simply are not going to provide all that money to us. How big a, a problem is this? I mean, is some, should we be staying up at night worrying about this, or is this something that we can, well, it'll sort itself out? It's not an enormous problem at the moment. It is, for most people in this country, and for most people in Asia, a very comfortable arrangement. They get to sell us more goods. They have a vehicle for investing their savings in the United States. We get relatively inexpensive goods and cheap money which is great for housing, great if you want to finance a, a house or a car or a refrigerator. So everyone's pretty happy, or not everyone's pretty happy, if, unless you're, um, if you're a manufacturer or, or in the service sector competing with this very competitive Asian environment, then you're not particularly happy. But a lot of consumers are, and certainly American homeowners are. There are some policymakers, though, and, and people like Warren Buffett, a famous uh, investor, who keep saying, you know, this is very serious, we're getting into hock to foreign lenders, this is creating a great vulnerability, interest rates could soar all of a sudden, this could be very damaging to the fabric of it this is, nation. For me, it is a medium-term vulnerability, there's no question about that. This is a situation that is not sustainable over the long term, any more than it is for you or me or anyone else to go charging more and more on our credit card. We might be able to do that for some time, but, but not forever. And it is not sustainable. And when the, the unthinkable happens, or at least the, something we would, might not like to think about happens, which is foreigners use more of their money at home, or they per perceive a higher risk here, then interest rates go up. Then the American housing industry, which is booming, right. some might say, and I would say, probably now in a bubble, at least in some parts of the country, when that occurs, when rates go up, it's harder to finance your home. People who've borrowed home equity loans now have to pay a higher rate because most of them are floating rate. People who have these hybrid mortgages where it's fixed for a while and then it floats, they're going to have to pay more. So a lot of homeowners will find that a very easily financeable mortgage today might not be so easily financeable tomorrow. And of course, government bond rates would then go up. The dollar would go down, so we would perhaps over a period of time, get out of this by an improved trade balance. But while we were doing it, we'd have much higher interest rates at home, consumer would suffer, the housing industry would suffer, and the economy would slow down a lot. So you can't depend on this flow of capital forever. It does create vulnerabilities. And if there's a terrorist attack, our heavy dependence on foreign capital will really be a liability because we will have a big budget deficit, much bigger than now, to, to finance the reconstruction and the, to get the economy going to a higher rate of growth. And we will also find foreigners saying, well, the American economy is more vulnerable. We're going to be much more careful, more reluctant about lending the U.S. money. So we do have these vulnerabilities to a financial meltdown and a terrorist attack to which we're, we're vulnerable, as our leaders remind us. That would have major negative impacts on the financial markets, particularly as foreigners might not finance our economy as much. Now, one of the things that the Treasury Secretary has been trying to do is to get the Chinese to um, change the relationship of the yuan, the Chinese currency, with the dollar. What, why is that considered uh, helpful? What would that do for us? And, and what are the, what's the outlook for that? 
Well, the Treasury Secretary thinks that if the Chinese raise the value of their currency, their goods will be less competitive here and our goods will be more competitive there. That is to a degree true, but there's very little overlap between what we make and what the Chinese make. So we would find Chinese goods probably costing more here, but whether it, would use, whether it would lead to a major improvement in the trade balance is not clear. The hope is that if the Chinese currency goes up, all the other Asian currencies would go up too. And since on a trade-weighted basis, about 40 percent of our imports come from Asia, if those uh, currency rates went up, their goods in general will be less competitive vis-a-vis -vis American goods, and that would, over a period of time, lead to an improvement in the trade balance. It probably would over a period of time, but it wouldn't be an immediate cure-all for our trade imbalance because we're still sucking in a lot of imports from all around the world, and, and um, we're going to still have the, that trade deficit for quite some time. It may be better if the Asians allow their currencies to go up, but it probably is not going to go away. Is there some reason that the Chinese are resisting? I mean, what, why is it artificially low now, in which case wouldn't it make sense for them to? The Chinese are resisting in part because their priorities are to create a lot of jobs. They have 200 million floating workers. They're laying people off from these big state enterprises, which they're closing. They have people coming in from the farms, 10 million or so a year. They have new people coming into the workforce. They have a very big unemployment problem. And as a result, they want to keep up the rate of growth of exports. And they are not particularly happy about having their currency rise. In addition, they're attracting lots of foreign capital. And the foreign capital comes in in part because the Chinese economy is very competitive. So the, if they raised interest rates, their fear is they would be a little less competitive. Now, if they, if they raised the exchange rate, say, 5% or 10%, it probably wouldn't have an enormous impact on their competitiveness, but it would have some. And at this point, they're concerned about that. The other thing is they have a weak banking system with a lot of problems, a lot of uh, non-performing loans, bad debt, and they're a little bit worried that if they have uh, a, a, an appreciation of their currency, it could have an adverse effect on their financial markets as well. So they're moving in the direction of doing this. They probably will at some point, but they won't under American pressure. And they're not going to do it. It's not an easy decision for them. Right. We'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time, and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate, master's, and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Bob Hormatz, Vice Chairman of Goldman Sachs International. Can you explain why periodically people seem to get very concerned about countries like South Korea and what the central banks there are doing with their dollar reserves? The South Koreans and some other central banks in Asia have decided that they have too much of a concentration of their reserves, their foreign exchange reserves, in dollars. So they've indicated in a very gentle way that they're going to diversify to a degree. Now, this makes a lot of sense because normal investors are told, diversify your holdings. Don't have all your stocks in technology stocks or in oil stocks or in uh, REITs. You should have a diversification of portfolio. So many of the Asians who now have 70, in some cases, 80 percent of the reserves in dollars are saying to themselves, look, we're still going to have a lot of dollars, but maybe we'll put a larger portion of the new money we get into euros or Australian dollars or Swiss francs or pound sterling or yen. So this is what the Koreans suggested a little while ago. Now, why is it important to the United States? Because we depend so heavily on the inflow of foreign capital, particularly from foreign central banks like the Korean Central Bank, the Chinese, Japanese, and others. If they diversify, it means that perhaps the dollar will go down because they won't buy as many dollars. They'll buy more euros. They'll buy more yen. So this is one of the things that um, concern the financial markets. When the Koreans suggested they were going to do this, 
what happened? The dollar went down, interest rates went up, and interest rates went up because we're so heavily dependent on foreign capital that if there should be less of it coming in, that would mean that our financial markets would get less capital and interest rates would go up. So markets anticipated that, and that's why they reacted so badly. What do you think are the policy adjustments that need to occur in order to work our way slowly out of this fix? Well, we really have paid very little attention to this problem. Um, and we've, in particular, we've paid little attention, much too little attention, to the underlying difficulties that the American economy faces. We have a very big budget deficit. It may be a little better this year than last, but still it's a very big budget deficit for a country that's three years into recovery. We're crowing about perhaps reducing it to a degree. We should actually have a budget surplus now because we've been growing very rapidly and countries that are growing should generate more revenues. But with all the big tax cuts of the last few years and with the spending that we're engaged in, uh, a lot of it for non-essential reasons, we now have a very big budget deficit and a big appetite for capital for the federal government. The second thing we are doing is we as a country, American households, are spending a lot and saving very little. So w between the household sector and the government sector, we're spending too much, saving too little, and the money comes from abroad. The foreigners finance this. And as a result of that, uh, we're able to live, in effect, beyond our means, which is we'll import more than we export. We import a lot of goods in this country. So what we need to do, I think, is boost the household savings rate. Which is done how? Which is done essentially by people consuming a little bit, a little bit less and mm -hmm. saving a little bit more. How but, do we make that cultural shift, though? We're a, a country that loves to spend. Well, it's true, but, but this is not a long-standing thing. In the 1950s and 60s, we were relatively big savers. This is a relatively new phenomenon. The second thing is the federal government should be exert, exercising a lot more discipline. Uh, we had big tax cuts and big spending increases. We have not set priorities. This is the first time we've gone to war when the government has not either increased taxes or cut back on non-essential domestic spending or both. During the Korean War, we raised taxes and cut spending. During the World War II, we did. Even during Vietnam, we did. This time, we have not. So we're trying to have money for the military, and, and I think the military needs the money to protect our security money for a lot of domestic programs, many of which are certainly not essential, and big tax cuts, which uh, are nice for people who get them, but build up the, the federal debt over the long term. And, and then we have a big problem in the future years because we have to pay for Social Security and Medicare, and we're just beginning to realize how big the bill for those is going to be. So if we're going to reduce our dependence on foreign capital, domestic savings have to go up. The government has to be much more uh, frugal and responsible about fiscal policy. And the, the, the most important thing, other than the financial, is we've got to become a more competitive producer of a lot of goods. We've neglected our education system in this country. We're not spending as much on R&D. And if we're going to compete with the Chinese and the Indians and, and, and others, we have to improve the quality of our workforce, which is to say more training, particularly in high school, in science and, 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 and mathematics and technology so people can compete with Chinese and, 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 and Indian kids. And uh, I should say that you see a lot of that because you travel so much in Asia and other countries, so you, you have a pretty good sense yeah. of how we're stacking up. Yes, when you go to China, it's not only that they're competitive on the kinds of low-cost products that we think, you know, like apparel and shoes, and they are competitive in those areas. But they're moving up the ladder very dramatically, as are the Indians. So they're going to compete with us in higher technology products over the course of the next uh, several years, and they already are. And they've built up these centers uh, of excellence around the country, both in China and India, many Silicon Valleys where they have production, they have research, they have development. They work with their uh, institutions like universities and, and, and research institutions to, to develop new kinds of technology which will enable them to be very, very competitive. So we've got to prepare ourselves for the very strong competition for coming from this part of the world. And how do we do it? Education, training, more education, more training, 
R&D, particularly uh, basic and applied research, and we're just not doing that. We can't blame the Chinese for our weak educational system. We can't blame the Chinese for the fact the federal government is cutting back on research in a lot of areas. We can't blame the Chinese for the fact that we're undermining research and stem cell research, which, which the Chinese and the Indians and others are, are advancing at a very rapid pace. These are things we have to do. We go around blaming the rest of the world. We're not doing what we need to do at home. And, and frankly, I don't even think it's part of the serious political discussion. I mean, it's only a, a few naysayers. I mean, most of the time the issue is how can we reduce taxes even more? Well, that's the problem. I think there is, it's all well and good for people who get tax cuts to get them. That is a very nice thing. But you have to ask yourself, is that the best investment in the future of the United States? And my judgment is it is not. I'd much prefer to put more emphasis on basic uh, research and, and, and development in, in medicine and technology and energy. Look at the budget. It's very, very tight on those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I'd certainly prefer to put more into education. Now, I, I will be the first to admit that money doesn't buy good education. You really have to do a lot of other reforms, but it certainly helps to provide more support for good teachers. You really need teachers who understand science and technology. You need to get businesses to have people who do understand these things to work in the classrooms with the students, with the teachers, to help set curriculum and do other things of that sort. So, and, and we, we ultimately need to invest in more and more of our intellectual infrastructure in this country, and, 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 and we're not doing that. And we're building up a large debt that the next generation is going to have to pay. So we really have to set priorities. We haven't done this. If we're in a competitive race, and we have to deal with our national security because of terrorism. You need to set priorities and focus resources on our key objectives, not just dissipate them, as I'm afraid we've been doing. Let's just move for a minute over to Europe, where they've been facing many of these same issues. And we just saw recently a very interesting vote by the, the French that they did not want to embrace the uh, European Constitution. And of course, the euro fell and the and it dollar strengthened. How do we think, how should we think of ourselves um, in the international financial markets and in the currency markets vis-a-vis -vis Europe as opposed to Asia? I think we should look at Europe as a, an example of what we don't want to become um, <laughs> in the sense that the Europeans, not all of them, I think if you go to Eastern Europe and Britain and Ireland and places like that and Spain and Portugal and also Scandinavia, they're very, very entrepreneurial. You're seeing a lot of very innovative things going on. And you're also seeing some innovation on the European continent, the main countries in the European continent. But the problem is the world's moving very rapidly. It's like the, 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 the Red Queen and Alice in Wonderland. You have to run faster and faster just to stay in place. And the Europeans are, are barely able to stay in place. They are now, particularly if you see the French vote, there are a lot of reasons for the French vote. A lot of, a lot of French voters didn't like Chirac. A lot of them didn't like the government. But part of the problem was they saw more unemployment. They have a very high rate of unemployment. Foreign workers are coming in, outsourcing that they call delocalization in France, but it's outsourcing. There are a number of things of this nature and the expansion of the European Union. So they were really hoping that maybe this progress or what was called progress by their leaders would slow down a little bit. Uh, and, and I think the, the, it's not that they're inward looking, but there's a certain, uh, there's a certain um, quality of, of, of economic nationalism that's beginning to emerge in Western Europe, particularly in France and to a degree in Germany. And uh, it means they're not as keen on globalization, certainly not as keen on globalization of the workforce and of financial markets and of trade. And they want to, they want to preserve their culture and these foreign forces are sort of impinging on their culture, and they're concerned about it. We've been very fortunate to have the vice chairman of Goldman Sachs International, Bob Hormatz, as our guest today. Thanks, Bob, for being on the show. Great to be with you. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. 
The United States is pursuing a perilous policy path. We are spending as if there's no tomorrow, betting that foreign governments will be happy to continue subsidizing our profligate ways. The central banks of China, Japan, and South Korea in particular have been propping up our dollar and allowing us to continue operating with artificially low interest rates. It is extremely risky to rely on the goodwill of foreign central bankers as a central tenet of our economic policy. If policymakers do not act to correct the imbalances that have been developing, the financial markets will exert their own will, as we have seen time and time again. Global investors will simply demand higher rates of return on their dollar-denominated assets. Translation? Higher interest rates in the United States, perhaps sharply higher, which would likely trigger a steep recession. There is, of course, another path, one that would require us to get our massive federal budget deficits under control. But that would mean taking difficult political steps to get more tax revenue from large corporations and wealthy individuals, and addressing our ballooning Social Security and Medicare entitlement programs. Sadly, our recent political history suggests we are incapable of putting our financial house in order. Every day that we refuse to act, we just dig ourselves deeper and deeper into a hole. I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is the Gloomy Outlook from USA, Inc.